Well, hello, everybody. Uh, we are glad that you decided to spend part of your morning with us today. Before we get started with today's service, we have a few announcements that we would like to uh, make you aware of. And the first thing is uh, talking about our reopening on June the 7th, next Sunday. We've posted some information on our social media platforms as a guide to what to expect when we return back to service with one another. And uh, we want you to know that we're offering two services, one regular worship service that has the typical social limitations as uh, you've been seeing churches as they've been returning back to service with one another. And we're going to have that service here in the sanctuary as well as a combined Abana Land and Upstreet family worship style environment in the Upstreet Theater in our community center. Now both of these services are going to be available at two different time slots, a 9 a.m. and a 10.45 a.m. service. And we cannot wait to see you. You can attend both or just one. It's up to you, but we want to give you opportunities for your family as we uh, cannot wait to get back together. Be sure to check out our social media platforms this week as we're going to provide some more examples of what service is going to look like and some more information on those guidelines. Also, please know uh, our services will continue to be online for those of you uh, who may be in the at-risk category uh, or who still maybe feel a little uncomfortable about attending in person. Uh, don't worry, we've got you covered online. Also, uh, something we mentioned to you last week, through our partnership with the Lake Cumberland District Health Department and the Heart for Change program, they are requesting recipes. That's right. We would like for you to share with us your favorite mouth-watering recipe, uh, maybe something that your grandmother or your mother or something that's been passed down through many generations of your family have shared through those times and that you would love for other people to enjoy. You can send us those recipes uh, that are your favorite to our email, as you see right here on the screen, at plugin at Dumbledore christian.org. Now, lastly, today we are concluding our series called We the People, where we have talked about a conversation or had a conversation about politics and religion. And today's topic is all about maturity, how we are to handle matters of dispute in our lives. And man, isn't it, you know, we could say needed right now in uh, the current state of, of our world, a little maturity in our political conversation. So, uh, if you think that's something needed, then we're glad that you joined us today. All of that being said, let's now get started with today's service. Sing it out.
a new song to y'all last week called Build My Life. And I think it's so appropriate as we're starting a new year and um, that we're going to build our life on Jesus. <laughs> Today, we're concluding our series uh, called We the People, talking about a conversation about politics and religion. And while I know that I don't talk about politics uh, a lot, you know, or very often, I do recognize the importance of addressing issues that Jesus himself spoke about and issues that scripture teaches us about as it pertains to the way that we live as Jesus followers in the culture and in the setting uh, of the world that we find ourselves in. And as we've said over the past few weeks, that when it comes to politics, there's oftentimes a tension for Jesus' followers. In fact, we looked at it this way. We said there's a, a polarization and a generalization that occur when we talk about this hot topic of politics. And the way that we view ourselves and the way that we view other people through our political lens, right? We, we view people and we say, you know, in the polarization of, of there's people on the right and there's people on the left, you know, some people are in the middle, but they just can't make up their mind, right? We, we talk about people in terms of, of then, you know, descriptive verbs of, of co uh, conservative or liberal, or maybe we say though, that group is heartless or that group is, you know, a bleeding heart group, or that group's a capitalist or that group is socialist. And we all know, and we try to draw these battle lines between us due to a political view and, and due to these descriptive words that we used, we have a tendency not only to polarize people, okay, but also to generalize groups of people falsely based on a political view or agenda or the support of a candidate. Mature, compassionate people who are empathetic of others don't fall for this kind of stuff. But political rhetoric feeds on this kind of stuff. And so I believe we're better than this. We are better than, than the political nonsense. And we need to make sure that we stop it as followers of Jesus. And so we've said this over the past couple of weeks, that, that we need to be able to disagree politically, but also at the same time love unconditionally. That though we disagree on social issues and we disagree about parties and candidates and agendas, we would never allow those things to become an obstacle to a person and to us loving a person that God himself loves, that Jesus died for. That we would choose to love people regardless of our disagreements and our diversity to fulfill the very law of Christ, to love one another the way that Christ loved us. And so that then we live a life that is complete and full of love, that we're fulfilling the laws of God and what God has required for us, and especially as we complete the mission that the church has been given. And we stated it last week in this way. We said, as followers of Jesus, our lives are no longer about me, right? but getting my own way, but rather about the we, the collective, we, the people of God, showing the way for people to follow Jesus. It's not about me getting my way, but it's about we showing people the way to follow Jesus. And over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at a few topics about this. Specifically, the first week, we looked at division, and we said that we can't, you know, allow anything to get in the way of our unity, that division hinders the church, that Jesus himself prayed for unity, that the world would know that a Savior was sent, and that, that we would then begin to pray, right, for oneness, that we would reach many, that we would have influence with the world, and that we can't afford to allow anything or anyone to divide us, because our unity and our oneness is central 
and essential to the core of our mission and the core of who we are. And then in week two, we talked about rebellion. That was last week. And the opposite of that and what we as a church need to characterize, which is humility, something that we need to have within us. And we focused on submitting to authority because in politics, authority is a big, big question mark here, right? But we've been commanded as the church, unless we are forced to do something that would lead us to sin against God. But we stated last week, very few of us have ever experienced anything like that. We fuss about it all the time, but we live in a land of freedom. You've always had a choice to stand in your faith. And yes, maybe at times there's been consequences, sure, but still, you're here and you're alive. You, you are living right now because of a nation that has given you those types of freedoms. And so we take our cue from Jesus, not from culture, on how we respond to authority. And Paul was clear that Jesus submitted himself to the authorities of the day, but he ultimately submitted himself to God. And he said to render unto Caesar what Caesar's, but give to God what is God's? Amen. That, that was a big point for us last week as we looked at how we're to relate with authority. Now, today what we're talking about is pettiness. When it comes to politics, pettiness is a problem. And the way around pettiness is to continue to grow in our maturity in Christ. Now, pettiness comes from a French word, uh, petite, and you've probably heard that before, and it means small. And it's to indicate matters of less importance. Like pettiness means we have an attitude that leads us to behavior that, that is an undue concern about trivial matters, small things. And it often results in arguments and, and spiteful behavior. It also it can, can mean like a person is small-minded, you know, and, and maybe you've in, in encountered people like that. Maybe you yourself, I know I've been that way before in things that I've believed or thought. I've been small-minded, but we have to be better than this. And, and something that we can all agree to, okay, and if we're all honest, is that everyone has been petty at some point. We all experience this. We all know about this. But the focus of today's message is pettiness in regards to when we become so entrenched, when we draw the battle lines against someone else, that we continually exhibit an attitude that leads to unnecessary footholds of the enemy in our lives and that causes arguments even among believers, among the family of God. And this is especially true, like we're talking about in politics, when we attribute greater worth to our view, our political view, than we do to a person a you, a you sitting next to you right now, a you that lives next to you, that works next to you in your life. If we ever make our view greater than, or we give more merit to our political view than a person, we are in the wrong. And listen, there are so many topics in life that are debatable, that are disputable, that are not a matter of good versus bad, but simply a matter, you know, of good, better, or best. I mean, it's not like we're talking about right versus wrong, but it's about preference and opinion. It's about dispute. And we constantly bicker over these things. But what we're going to see today is that that type of behavior is wrong. And that pettiness, even though it, it, it is easy to have in politics and our political agendas, has no place in the church. We are bigger than that. We are better than that. And there is a bigger, better work at play and that we need to accomplish. And so Paul, writing in his letter to the Romans, as we're going to pick back up with this today in chapter 14, he addresses some of this pettiness as it pertains to disputes. And then he offers us an amazing solution. So let's check it out. Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Here's what Paul says except the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. And right up front, here's what Paul says. We are to accept each other, accept each other into fellowship, accept each other in our lives, in our groups, in our homes, even those who we would maybe say is weak in their faith. And we're to do this without quarreling over disputable matters, okay? And here's what he's talking about. A person who might be weak in their faith might be new to faith, or a person who maybe, as Paul's going to show in a minute, has been raised in, in, a, in a legalist kind of mentality uh, where do's and don'ts are, are kind of, you know, based on, you know, th that bases our, our, our spiritual maturity, those types of things. Or maybe this is a person who has lacked a, a good teaching in their life, or maybe they've lacked opportunity to live out their faith or encountered things in life. But what Paul is saying is there are varying levels of maturity when it comes to our spiritual walk, and there are varying perspectives on opposing views, especially uh, on views of hot topics. And so then he gives us an example of one of those issues. In the first century, 
uh, Paul addresses the, the things about eating. He says, one person's faith allows them to eat anything. One person's faith, this person says, I can eat anything I want. Everything's clean. But another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. And he says, look, so one of the things that, that disrupted the first century church were their eating habits. And their eating habits were influenced by spiritual reasons, okay? Uh, many of them would say, hey, I don't want to eat food that I believe may have been used or sacrificed to pagan gods or to idols. Others, uh, maybe Jews who were becoming uh, Christians were saying, look, I don't want to give up my kosher diet because I've been raised all my life that certain foods are, are not good for me and I don't want to eat those things, uh, so I'm going to hold to a stricter diet. And Paul, interestingly enough, uses this word weak to address those with a stricter, more legalistic attitude towards this topic of food. And the reason is because this attitude in many of them, and you've experienced this before, lends itself to a lack of love for other people who have a different take on things as simple as a dietary habit. In fact, we could say this about pettiness. Pettiness, and we've all experienced it, has a way of making us think that we are the strong ones and that those who don't keep the rules the way we do are weak. We become high-minded, lofty-minded, like holier than thou. You know, well, I don't do this and they do, so they're bad people, I'm good people, that sort of idea. But Paul is saying, look, I know we don't like to admit it, okay? And it's, but it's true. All of us have been trapped by this at some point saying I'm strong and, and, and they're weak, you know, based on what they do. But Paul's going to expose this as an error, and he's going to expose it as a trap that we all fall into. He says this in Romans 14, verse 3, The one who eats everything, then he says, okay, must not, this is something as a church we must not do, treat with contempt the one who does not. So if you eat anything, right, and you have the freedom to do that, he's saying, or you have one view on, on something, while another person has another view, they do not. Don't hold them in contempt. Don't stiff arm them. Don't push them away. Just because they don't partake in that, don't call them a prude. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't play that game with them. That is a trap. Don't write those people off who have a differing view than you. And I can almost hear in the audience, the crowd, maybe that this is being read to saying, yeah, Paul, you get those people, you know, we don't do those things. They do them and they shouldn't hold us in contempt. But Paul's going to say, it's not just one sided. He continues and he says, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. So both sides need to change the way they interact with each other. And I love this. He's saying, look, between the two, there's no difference. Okay, there's this line that's been drawn, but, but he makes this point that neither side should condemn or judge the other. And then he continues, and he says, And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God, look at this point he's making, has accepted them, and you could say both. There's two sides, two differing views. Both sides extremely convinced, convicted about this hot topic, highly, you know, debatable area of contention. And Paul says that God accepts both of them. Therefore, if we go back to that first part, Paul says, accept the one whose faith is weak. Meaning, when we choose to accept each other, then we are choosing to live and love like God. In fact, there's a quote from a pastor named Tony Evans. It's one of my favorite quotes. Tony Evans says this, Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. He didn't come to draw the battle lines on, on disputable matters and say, well, yeah, this side or that side. He, no, he came to take over the whole situation. And what Paul is saying is the same thing. There are no sides on some of these things. God so loved the entire world, even if we want to get down to sinner and saint, God loved the world so much, all of it, that he gave his son and everyone, right? That while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, and just process that for a minute, while we were all guilty, while we were all deserving of punishment, regardless of it, in spite of it, Christ died for all of us. He is our model. He's the one who transcends everything, who came to take over. He's the example that we need to follow. And so Paul, kind of taking this approach, says, here is how this gets practical in our lives. He says, who are you? to judge someone else's servant. The translation for us today, uh, how we could relate to this, you know, we don't have servants necessarily, but let's put it in terms we can understand. Imagine for a minute your neighbor's kids, right? Your kids have a certain bedtime and they have a certain time to do homework or, or have snacks or whatever. 
you wouldn't dare go to your neighbor's house not being invited and put their kids to bed whenever your kids go to bed or tell them that they need to finish their homework before they can eat dinner or or whatever it may be right before they can go play uh, another way of looking at it maybe is in the form of businesses or businesses and, and their employees you wouldn't dare go into someone else's business and begin to reprimand or commend or whatever someone else's employee. We wouldn't do that, right? And so Paul's saying here, then why, why, think about it, why would we do this to other people? They don't serve you. They don't serve me. In fact, who they serve is God. And Paul continues and he says, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master servants stand or fall. And setting up this big point, he says, and they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. This is such a simple statement, but powerful implications for our life. You may not agree with them, but that doesn't make them wrong. And it doesn't make you wrong either. <laughs> Another great quote that, that I've heard over the past couple of years comes from uh, my friend Sarah. This is how I'm going to relate this. And here's what Sarah said about this situation. She said, I think many Christians will be surprised to find out that there will be a lot of people in heaven they didn't like people that you disagree with, people that you didn't see eye to eye with, people who had differing views than you, we're going to be surprised at the amount of people sharing heaven and eternity with us, and we probably couldn't stand them on this earth. You'd be surprised, I think is what Sarah would say, of the people. The Lord will make stand whenever we all come face to face with him. Those people who you and I were so convinced otherwise, perhaps, it's a good thing that you are wrong. It's a good thing that I'm wrong at times about this. It's a good thing that God is good and he's in charge and he's never wrong. And that heaven is a good thing and a good place. Now, this is a big idea. And it leads to this next point. Our cultural context determines our perspective. Something that we have to understand about life and understand about people is that, another way to say this, is that where we what we take a stand on is, is really informed by where we sit, our cultural context, the environment and family and situations that surround and, and made up our lives. Our cultural context determines our perspective, the things we take a stand about, the things that we, that we believe about, right? We just need to think about what that means, right? And that's a part of being mature. We don't have knee-jerk reactions to things. Instead, we don't underestimate the power of a calculated response. Maturity. We just need to pause. We need to think and process. We need to seek wisdom, and, and we need to be mature. And Lordy, don't we need more maturity in our political conversation as a nation right now? So Paul continues, and he says, One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. And so now Paul shifts to another topic, and I think that clearly shows that he's not just talking about food or just about days, but the overarching principle of disputable matters. He says, look, there's a debate. Some of these things are going to be uh, debated issues. It's the same today. Either way that you think about this, it's no big deal. It's a matter of an informed conscience. You should be fully convinced in your own mind. You shouldn't be out here trying to convince everybody else necessarily about these disputable matters. Besides, and this is what I found in my life, when have you ever been successful at convincing someone else of anything? If they're not ready to listen and to hear what you have to say, it's like casting pearls before swine, right? It's like talking to a brick wall. You've experienced it. And so he says, look, whatever you consider, Okay? Whatever it is that you consider, be fully convinced in your mind. Your conscience should be informed, and that's going to inform it through your faith and through what you know of the knowledge about Christ and about God and about your spiritual maturity. And so Paul continues. He says, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. you got to understand this. And whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And he continues, and he says, and whoever abstains does so to the Lord. And whoever gives thanks, then they do so to God. Whatever the case may be in disputable matters, both are convinced in their own mind that they're doing the right thing thing, that they're doing it for the right reasons. So now 
Paul doesn't just stop with food and, and special sacred days, but now he's going to take it to an extreme, two totally different sides, even greater than politics, left and right, conservative, liberal, red, blue, whatever. Here's what Paul has to say. He says, for none of us lives for ourselves alone. I like this. And none of us dies for ourselves alone. He says, life and death. Think about this. The separation of life can, and death. You can't get much more separated than that. He says, understand from the beginning of our lives to the end of our lives, our lives are connected to other people. And in the same way, he says, if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. And in the same way that our lives are connected from beginning to end, we should be living our lives totally and fully dedicated to God. And he continues and he says, for this very reason, Christ died. Why? Not so that he could pick sides, even in life and death, but instead that he would take over. This is the reason Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord, the ruler of both the dead and the living. He didn't take sides. He took over death and life, Lord of all. And all of us, regardless of our belief in these disputable matters towards these hot issues, you know, God is ruler of all these things. And so now... Paul's going to take these ideas and he's going to dig a little deeper and he's going to begin to apply them to our lives. He says, you then, okay, if this is the case that Jesus is Lord of all, even life and death, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat with them with contempt? Paul's question for the first century audience is the same question I think we all need to be asked. Why would we go around judging? Why would we go around showing contempt for people based on actions that, of what they do or what they don't do. We should be more mature than that as a church. We should be you know, seeking wisdom of God to be able to see God's plan in life. And look at how Paul adds to this. He says, For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Those who are wise, those who are mature, empathetic, compassionate, who are understanding who Christ is, who understand who they are, who, you know, who they are and whose they are belonging to God. They know that we're all on the same playing field, that all of us will stand before God's judgment seat. All of us will give an account. And what he's talking about here in the, in the judgment seat is the great white throne judgment where God will give out reward or punishment and that nobody escapes. Nobody escapes. And so Paul says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And that account, okay, of, of what, who we are has really nothing to do with anything that we do or anything that you do, but it's all about Jesus. The side of reward and the side of punishment are only separated by the blood of Christ. That's it. Not by you being any more holy than anybody else unto yourself. What separates the two groups is Jesus, period. So why, Paul's asking, would we think otherwise? Why would we act otherwise? Why would we treat people with contempt and with judgment Instead, shouldn't we be then compelled to love people and help them grow in their knowledge and relationship of Christ? Not quarreling with each other, but caring for each other and having concern for one another? Isn't that what Jesus died for? To give us that opportunity and that freedom? And so Paul, he alludes to that, he points to that, he says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. If God's got judgment under control, then you don't have to worry about people being judged for their actions or for, for their lives or whether or not they were in Christ. God's got that. That's not our responsibility. So let's just stop that nonsense, okay? Final judgment's not ours. And so Paul, talking about this, let's stop passing judgment on each other. And then he goes on, he says, instead, and this is what we have to do in this, okay? This is a big deal. You got to make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. And what that means is you have to make up your mind to put other people before you. And so Paul continues, he says, I am convinced, he's going to share with us, you know, a little bit of his point of view. He says, I am convinced being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean into itself. And that's, this is a big deal because Paul was a Jew, right? But he's saying here that all those restrictions and everything, even from him being a Pharisee, keeping all the rules, nothing in itself is, is uh, unclean. Nothing of itself. And we could talk about, like I mentioned earlier, all sorts of things in life, objects of life. He covers everything. Nothing covers everything. Nothing is unclean in itself. But here's what he says. If anyone regards something as unclean, 
then let's just say this this next phrase out loud just say it right where you're sitting okay for that person it is unclean did you catch that if anyone regards something as unclean then for that person i mean maybe you need to just say that more times out loud because listen some people you know we got to get this right because some people struggle with food others don't some people struggle with sex others don't some people struggle with alcohol others don't and the list could go on and on and on and on we're all different and if something is unclean or un unfitting unfitting for for our lives something we shouldn't partake in we have to know ourselves have enough wisdom and maturity to know ourselves of where we need to draw lines and have boundary lines you know we've talked about that a lot guardrails in our life against things and for for all of us those guardrails may be in in different places in life but if we struggle with it and someone else doesn't we're not to judge them or condemn them for this instead it's unclean for me for that person who says that and then he continues and he says and if your brother or sister and I understand this is distressed because of what you eat so it's unclean to that person but if a brother or sister is distressed by what you eat then you're no longer acting in love and so though things are you know unclean or not unclean though th the things are permissible you have freedom to do what you want to do nothing in itself is unclean it doesn't justify us ever hurting other people right how important do you think it is to jesus for his disciples to act in love and not distressing people because of our lives he says clearly living that way means that pettiness and pride and all sorts of issues and you know, division rebellion is getting in our hearts here and we're in danger of distressing people and causing them to stumble putting a stumbling block in their path and so paul continues and he says do not let do not by your eating destroy someone for whom christ died so maybe a great way of saying this or wrapping this point up is if christ can give up his life for you then you can give up your pettiness. If Christ can give up his life for you, then you can give up your political view. If Christ can give his life for you, then what does that mean for us? And is there any limitation for what we should be willing to give up? We need to get this right. We cannot allow small-mindedness, judgment, contempt, or anything else that would be a, a divisive thing or a stumbling block for other people to get in the way we need to grow up we need to mature we need to seek change to become complete and filled in christ so paul stating all this knowing this as he's writing this don't let you know by your eating or by what day you hold holy or whatever it is you know destroy somebody else for whom christ died he continues to kind of wrap up all these points he says therefore do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil don't allow your freedoms to destroy other people and while it may be okay with you other people are distressed by it so you need to take caution in that uh, that would be dangerous to continue to do that in front of them or around them for the kingdom of god he says and this is the reason why is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit we can't allow anything a disputable matter to become between us and somebody else right of things of actual importance and what actually is important is the kingdom of god and living a life filled with the holy spirit growing in our maturity and our spiritual growth and paul continues he says because anyone who serves christ in this way is pleasing to god and receives human approval this way of living seeking the kingdom first loving god loving people being so focused on the mission of the church making disciples because that's how you you, you love people as you lead them to jesus and that's how you love god is by loving those people everybody wins it's a win 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 across the board so paul says then how should we respond to this let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Now, I just want to say that part out loud. Make every effort. Make every effort. Is that how we can really categorize our lives? Can you say that you make every effort that would lead to peace and mutual edification? Two things here. 
that peace is so important because we are to be peacemakers. We are to sow peace. But the second thing is really important too, mutual edification. That's mutual maturity, that we are called to help each other grow spiritually, to be mature, to be a mature body of believers presented to Christ. And Paul talked about that all through his letters that we find in the New Testament. Now, as a former teacher, I want to tell you that the way that I've always found that that's to be achieved is not by condemning people or holding people in contempt or judging them, but it's by building others up. By It's by empowering them. It's And what we're going to find in a little bit, it's about listening to them. And as followers of Jesus, that's what we're called to do, to help each other, to bear each other's burdens, to serve one another in love. And that's discipleship of growing to be like Christ together. So, Paul goes on. He says, look, that mission of growing to be like Christ together, do not destroy the work of God, of discipleship, of making disciples for the sake of food or for the sake of any disputable matter. The work of God is what's most important and everything else, everything else should be in our peripheral view. The work of God and the kingdom of God should be our laser focus, but everything else is in the periphery of our view. And Paul then, you know, is just saying, he continues with this and he's saying, look, I want to give you my perspective on this. He says, all food is clean. Just, just please understand this, you know, on whatever side that you're on, this isn't a matter of right or wrong. It's a matter of good, better, and best. All food's clean. Jesus declared that, you know, for us. We don't have to live under those laws of certain foods being unclean anymore. And he goes on to say, all food's clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is wrong for us to do anything that causes somebody else to stumble. The object is clean in itself, but the motive must be clean as well. And we should never allow something that, that is a disputable matter, something we eat, something we drink, something that is not of the kingdom of God to be a stumbling block to the people around us, regardless of what it is, right? Regardless of what we do or we don't do. And he explains it a little further and he says, it is better, not, you know, right or wrong. It is better not to eat meat or to drink wine as he brings that you know category into this now or to do anything else. He covers all the bases here that will cause your brother or sister to fall. If something has a potential to hurt your brother or sister, it would be a tragedy on us if we would use our freedom in Christ to negatively impact their life, especially their faith and what they believe, which consequently could impact their eternity. So the question then remains for us, what do we do? Here's what Paul says. So whatever you believe, no matter what side of the platform you're on, on these disputable matters, whatever you believe about these things, keep them between yourself and God. Translation, just stop talking. Stop trying to convince everybody else. Be convinced in your own mind. Live with peace of mind and for yourself and what you do between you and God. You don't have to flaunt your thoughts or your opinions or whatever else to anybody else. Stop the pettiness. Stop the political rhetoric. Stop propagating, you know, political agendas and points because that's not what is most important. It's pettiness. Now, as a side point, I want to point this out. This is kind of something that popped in my mind today and I added it in. But you know how you can identify if you have a problem with pettiness? Here's, here's how you can identify if you have a problem with pettiness. Spending more time quarreling over disputable matters rather than discipling people to Jesus may be a good indicator that you have a pettiness problem. So let me say it again. If you spend more time disputing matters, right, quarreling over things, than you do actually discipling and loving people to Jesus, helping them grow in, in their spiritual maturity, then maybe that's a good indicator that you have a pettiness problem. And, and look, I know if, if, you know, your political view, you know, is, is what you're known for. I get this. I mean, we all have stands that we take, but if you're known based on your political view, not based on the love that you have for Jesus, you know, if somebody sees you come and, and, and the thing that they say is, oh no, here he or she comes. We know what the conversation is going to be about. We know what's about to come next. You know, oh boy then listen, you have a problem with pettiness. 
and you're allowing things to get in the way of what matters most, and we've got to stop this nonsense, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. We are compelled to stop this. So, here's what Paul says. Whatever you believe about these things, keep them between yourself and God. And he says, and you've got to stop this because it's going to lead to a better life. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Blessed is the one who's known more for their love, not for their, their quarreling over disputable matters. Because then when people see them, it's not, oh boy, here they come, you know, watch out. It's a welcoming uh, uh, attitude. People want you to be around. You promote peace, right? And that's pleasing to God, as Paul writes, and it's pleasing to people. And again, it's a win-win-win situation. We are called to be, and this is what we've said over the past few weeks, we are called to be the unified people of God, the humble people of God, and then also this week, we are called to be the mature people of God, to have maturity in our lives. And according to Jesus, as we read his words and as we, we listen to what Jesus says, he says, look, according to Jesus, maturity in the church, just like unity and just like humility, it's not extra it's expected. It's part of who we are. But the problem we said is that maturity doesn't come naturally to humanity, just like unity doesn't come naturally and humility doesn't come naturally. So why is this important that we talk about this? Why is this important that Paul is addressing this? Why is it important to know that it doesn't come naturally? Because we have to be intentional about this. We have to choose in our minds to make up our minds not to live this way. Well, Paul writes in another letter in the New Testament, it's called 2 Timothy, a second letter that he wrote to a young man named Timothy, which was his protege, in which he put in charge of uh, leading churches throughout the Mediterranean rim and helping them get going. And, and some of the things that Paul teaches and what he says is specific commands to us on what to do with all this information that we just heard. Here's what Paul says. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. We should know this. Don't have anything to do with this stuff, Timothy, and don't let the people of God have anything to do with it either because he continues and he says, and the Lord's servants, that's us, followers of Jesus, must not be quarrelsome. Look at these characteristics, he says. They must not be quarrelsome, must be kind to everyone, able to teach, and not resentful. Are those the characteristics that describe your life? Not quarrelsome? Or are you known as the quarrelsome guy or the quarrelsome girl because of, especially talking about this idea of politics? Are you, you know, kind to everyone? Or is it really more about, you know, letting people know what's on your mind rather than being kind? Are you able to teach? Are you able to instruct and guide people in spiritual truths? And are you not resentful? Do you have peace? Do you experience peace and love for other people, mutual edification, mutual maturity? Paul is warning Timothy, and he warns us. He says, keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. Warn them before God. This is a big deal about quarreling for wor about, uh, with words. It is of no value. It has no good in our lives whatsoever, and it only ruins those who listen. People who are hearing these disputes, it ruins ruins them. It turns them from faith. Now listen, this isn't new. This isn't even complicated. But sometimes, and the reason we're talking about politics is because we have to say what everybody else should know so that everybody will actually remember to do it, right? Now, to apply all this very quickly, I want to give you a template. Based on everything we've just read, I want to give you a template on how to have a better political conversation with people now, because it's very important that we have it now, but also later in life and for the rest of your lives. And this conversation, this template conversation, uh, will lead us to pause, to, to, to take a, a break just to see things differently and to understand that what we don't know, we can learn and that there's a better way forward, a better way forward. So the first part of this better way forward and the goal in mind, okay, is ultimately that we would just, we would just hear, we would pause and listen. As we said, the first goal in this is to listen, to listen. And specifically what I mean by listen in the conversation, when you're talking with somebody who doesn't see things the way you do, you listen, you're slow to speak, quick to, to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, but specifically listen to people who don't experience the world the way you do. 
Listen to people who have a different context of life than you do. The haves, the have-nots, the Christians, the not-Christians, the young, the old, the gay, the straight, the married, the single, those in the military, those who don't like the military, those on the right, those on the left. Don't be petty just because they have a differing view. Stop long enough and listen. But don't just listen. Next, you need to learn something. You need to be listening to learn, okay? For the sake uh, of saying, well, I listened to them, but not to learn anything is, is null and void. It's, it's ridiculous, okay? We need to stop. We need to accept them, as Paul is saying. We need to accept them. Maybe not what they do. You know, We don't, don't have to accept their view, but we have to accept them, and we need to listen, and we need to learn. And as Christians, we don't need to be afraid of opinions and differing opinions. We should be the most curious people that live. Just because somebody else has a different view doesn't mean that it's a threat to my view or to your view. So don't discount information just because it's different than the way you think or the way you've been raised. It is, and people experience it, and we can learn a lot about that person. We just have to listen to what they're saying. Or maybe to say it this way about learning, be a student, not just a critic. Isn't it true that you and I, we all, are professional critics? And we didn't need any training. We didn't have to go to school for that. We are just naturally great critics. Some of you are so good, in fact, that uh, your family knows this. You'll even mute the TV on occasion, won't you? Just to give your own commentary on an issue, right? And the rest of the family's like, we already know what you think. Turn the, the volume back up. We can't be doing this, right? This can't be what characterizes us. We have to stop. We need to listen. We need to learn. We need to have compassion and empathy and care and concern for people. We need to learn about why that they stand, you know, for issues that they stand for. What is the cultural context? Where are they sitting in life? What have they been raised with? You know, what are those factors that have influenced their way of thinking? We can learn a lot about someone. We all say from time to time, yeah, but, but I don't understand how they could, could think that. I don't understand why they could support that. How could they ever, you, you know, do those things? And when we say those things, do you understand that what we're saying is that we don't know everything, right? And if we don't know everything, then, then shouldn't we seek to know and seek to understand, to be mature? And understanding something from someone else's point of view, it doesn't change our own view. It might, and that would be an unintended you know, re uh, consequence of it or result of it, but it helps us to connect with other people, to understand them better and about their lives. Because let's face it, you know, from time to time, we understand this about ourselves and, and, and we forget it about other people a lot, but everybody's behavior and everybody's view and everybody's politics, it makes sense to them. There's a reason for it, and we could learn about it if we would just choose to listen, right? We all stand for something based on where we sit in life or our, our cultural context. And the last word that we're gonna look at is love. The last L word here. So you have to listen, learn, and love. And never, ever, ever, ever allow a political view or a debatable, disputable matter, hot topic, whatever it may be, to drive a wedge between you and another person. Because, we've said this before, the you beside you is more precious to God than your political view. The you beside you is more precious to God than your political view. The you beside you is who Christ died for, just like he died for you. And while you were both sinners, still sinners, right? All of us were sinners. Christ died and gave up his life. So how dare any of us, any of us, place a political view or any view before a you that God cares about, that Christ died for. And so to summarize it, it looks like this. A better political conversation is held like this. We listen, we learn, and we love. We listen, we learn, and we love. Now to wrap this whole thing up, as we've said over the past couple weeks, there are some things we can add to our lives and add to our prayer lives to get this right. And the first one is pray for maturity. Make us mature so that we will promote peace. Make us mature, God, so that we will promote peace because peace and mutual maturity is the way forward. That is what we should be all about. Not quarreling over disputable matters. Not allowing pettiness into our lives and having, having an attitude of always having to be right about every little thing. And then lastly, the prayer goes like this, to love unconditionally. Look for an opportunity to love someone who views life differently or experiences life differently than you do. Look for an opportunity to love someone who views or experiences life differently than you do. And when we choose to do this, 
When this becomes who we are, we can then say that we have gained maturity in Christ. And we can't afford to allow anything to get in the way of us growing to become more like Jesus. And you know why this is important? Ultimately, why this is important? Because when we can say that we have, have, are seeking maturity and promoting maturity, then we can say that we are behaving like the people of God. We are the people of God. So, with everything that Paul said today, I hope and pray that through our political conversation of talking about unity, talking about humility, and talking about ultimately today of maturity, that we will embrace these things, that we will allow those ideas to be the filter that informs our political view or our view of the you that is beside us, and that we will never let it get in the way so that we can always, always uh, rejoice in the fact that we are the united, we are the humble, we are the mature people of God. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you for this morning and thank you for your word and this message that you have chosen to preserve for our benefit. What we pray for today, Father, is that we would allow nothing to get in the way and stand against these, these points, these characteristics that should uh, be what your church is known for, and that we would not let a political party, agenda, view, whatever it may be, get in the way and destroy these things uh, in our lives, because ultimately we know we are to shine a light so bright to the world that they believe that your son Jesus was sent here to be our Savior, and that he died on a cross to, to, to pay the pain for our sin. And we don't want to get in the way of that. We don't want to destroy your work because of a view that we hold when you gave your son for all of us. So Father, we pray for wisdom to see the way you see, to understand the way that you see things and understand things. Father, that we can do what you say. We are so happy to be your people, your family, your children. We are so happy, Father, to be part of the church and the mission that you've given us. And uh, Lord, we want to glorify you in everything that we say and everything that we do. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, thanks for being with us uh, today. We are excited to meet back with you physically next week. And so we will see you next week at nine o'clock and 1045 a.m. Have a wonderful rest of your day. God bless you. And we'll see you next week.